that uh, lovely context to reincarnation. So I'm going to share that story with you in a little while. And I'm going to tell you things that um, I believe to be true. I uh, believe them to be true because I've maybe told them and believed them. I've heard them several times and also things where I've had my own confirmation from, from my own guides. Um, for those of you who have never seen me work before, I also have a small spiritualist philosophy, philosophy show on Spiritual Psychic TV. And once a fortnight, we talk about di different subjects. And um, for those of you that understand the concept of, of, of a guide or guides, angels, helpers, inspirers, I believe that when I talk about things like reincarnation, I'm trying to pass on my knowledge of spiritualism. Not only am I got my granddad from heaven saying that's exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, I've also got uh, what I refer to as my spiritualist committee, a group of different guides from different backgrounds and generations that kind of blend their knowledge and information to try and give to me what I understand to be the truth. But regardless of that, whatever I say still is but my humble opinion. So if I say something which is different to yours, doesn't mean either of us are right, it doesn't mean either of us are wrong. And I would welcome that, uh, that challenge and that conversation today. As my dad always said to me when I first started in mediumship, take each no as a challenge from your communicator to ask them more information to provide that evidence. And we want to make this uh, interactive uh, this evening. So I'll start off, I say, we're talking about uh, my initial belief and concept of reincarnation. I'll share the story. And then from that, I will introduce a, a sort of a bit of debate. And I'd be really fascinated to sort of hear your own opinions, and particularly where you, you believe uh, the same sort of things of me uh, and other things where you, you have a difference of opinion. It'd be lovely to hear that. And uh, we can then have a sort of a bit of a closure towards the end. So if everyone's uh, happy with that, give me the thumbs up. Let me know that's all right. That all looks good. Yep, no one's switching off or leaving Zoom. So um, without further ado, I'll oh, there's a virtual thumbs up there from Katie. She's really grasped the, uh, the Zoom technology. Thank you, Katie. Um, and uh, Lawrence is using the, uh, the chat and, and sidebar as well. So the other thing you can do is click on the little chat bubble. Uh, I'm not a strong multitasker. So when I'm talking, I find it probably difficult to keep up the chat. But I will pause from time to time and have a look at that uh, chat window. Uh, if there are specific questions about something I've, I've just said, uh, then by all means, um, say it there and then and I can try and answer the question at the same time otherwise when we get to the end of the story it's a good time for sort of questions and other bits and pieces okay so reincarnation well let's break that word up first of all incarnation well the difference between a human being and a corpse I believe is personality it's our consciousness if you take the personality and consciousness out of a human being and that transcends to that place I call heaven, that for me is very much my belief of a life after life. So incarnation is, is about that personality entering that body as the vessel. And regardless of whether or not you believe in past lives and future lives, the most important thing I think right now is this life. Because you only die once. You get to live every day in that incarnation. So being the best possible version of yourself, going through many experiences in pursuit of happiness, I think that's a big, important point of understanding reincarnation. Reincarnation is important. I do believe in it. I'm obviously, I'm going to talk about it this evening. But the most important thing is this life, this incarnation. So introducing then the word re reincarnation, the idea that perhaps you haven't done this before. So if you haven't done this before, what did you do before? What happens to that sort of personality or that consciousness? I'm going to share a few different bits and pieces from uh, my friend Ralph Steadman's book as well. But there's a the story in particular I want to get to. And I, I learned lots about reincarnation as a youngster growing up in the church. And I also went through something called past life regression, which in a meditative state enabled me in my current body and consciousness to perhaps look back into um, previous lives and provide some evidence of that. So we could talk a little bit about the concepts of, of past life regression and understanding that. But actually, when you talk about reincarnation, actually the belief spreads across lots of the multiple existing and religions it goes back a very long time spiritualism as a religion as a modern religion is only really two or three hundred years old but at least one-fifth of the world's population 
has a belief in some sort of reincarnation. And you can go back 5,000 years and find evidence of people talking about the concept of multiple incarnations or reincarnations. Some of the major religions, you know, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and people talking about the will of rebirth. So lots of different sort of reflections of incarnation. And I'll save um, a talk for another day on what is God. But if we just look at energy very briefly, I know that everything that we're made of, everything we're sat on right now and touching right now is energy. It's made of atoms. That's as, you know, as far as scientists have got, they got to a point of breaking down everything that was anything to describe atoms. And at the time, atoms are what they believe was the smallest possible thing of something. And everything's made of atoms. Atoms are energy. We know we cannot destroy energy. We can only convert it or we can change it. And I think that's what happens in our life after life. And of course, if that energy is made up of atoms and our personality is potentially made of that energy, that intelligent energy, we know that beneath atoms are particles, particles of intelligent energy. So hypothetically, it is possible that those particles of energy could have been part of anything, of something, another personality, another consciousness. And perhaps if you go back far enough, perhaps those particles came together to form the personality. Perhaps those particles that we know exist even in very simple things like minerals and flowers and animal kingdom, perhaps all those particles come together to form atoms to form you. So that's one of the other assumptions that I'm going to make. I'm also going to talk uh, a very little bit about the idea of divine justice. If someone is convinced that there is only this one life that we're living, there are, of course, so many differences in the conditions of human beings. So I'm going to plant that seed and then I'm going to share this story with you. OK, so Dino was a tribal elder in a tribe in Western Australia. And he wanted to go out to a meeting in the bush with a friend. Neither of them had a car, so they borrowed one from a friend who had a garage. Dino had never driven this kind of car before, but he was an experienced driver and had no difficulty in handling. However, when they were returning late, the car suddenly broke down and Dino and his friend got out to see if they could sort out the problem. They opened the bonnet, but found in their amazement that there was not an engine. In fact, nothing even resembling part of an engine. So after much scratching of heads, they walked back to the city, arrived in the middle of night and roused their friend who drove them back to the car. He opened the boot, fiddled with something for a few moments and restarted the car. And that vehicle was a Volkswagen Beetle, which had its engine in the boot. They had been looking in the wrong place for it. It's the same when we're trying to make sense of life without knowing about reincarnation. To a certain extent, we're like the tribesmen in the Amazon jungle who see a car for the first time, watch the driver put something which looks like water in the back and then drive off. Without knowing that there is an engine or even knowing what an engine is, he has no way of understanding what he has seen. And for human beings, reincarnation is an engine that explains what happens and why it happens. Now, I really loved that, uh, that story and the idea that we are limited uh, by our own palettes as a, as a medium, our own culture, our own understanding. And of course, the more knowledge we have, the more questions we ask, the more we can do. So this is then the context story behind reincarnation, which took my own beliefs and understanding to a new level. So I'm going to ask that you put on your imagination and your creativity and you start to vision the story that I'm going to tell you. Once upon a time ago, there was a land in a mountainous area. The people that lived there had a miserable existence, having to work very hard to scratch a living out of the difficult stony soil. The country was totally ringed by mountains and the people were cut off from contact with anyone from anywhere. So they assumed and thought that their own land was all that existed in the whole world, the planet, the universe. But there were ancient legends that told of a journey from a far distant land of milk and honey, 
where the ancestors had originally inhabited. Some great catastrophe had taken place, which meant that the people had been forced to leave. And ever since that time, the descendants had lived out a pitiful existence in this poor mountainous terrain. Then one day there was great excitement in the country when mysterious posters appeared all over the place, inviting people to take part in a journey, a journey back to the land of the original ancestors, which they were told was called paradise. They were warned that it would be a long, hard journey, but when they arrived, they would find themselves in a state of happiness, such as they'd never dreamed of before. It would be a place where life would be perfect in every respect. All they needed to do was enroll to go on this journey, and the rest would be explained to them in due course. Naturally, everyone wanted to go, so they enrolled. When they were enrolled, they were told that the conditions that would apply throughout the journey. All these seemed to be very strange. The first was that the journey would take a very, very long time. And they would be traveling for many, many months. At the start of each day, they'd be shown a map of the overall area and they would be invited to choose the way they thought would be the best to take. They would have advisors to help them and tell them the general direction of the promised land but the advisors would not have the power to tell them which was the best. They would have to make all of the decisions for themselves, free will. However, their advisors and their inspires would be allowed to tell them what sort of equipment and clothing they would need, according to the different routes each one of them chose. They would then be issued with whatever clothing and equipment they were told they needed. They'd be given appropriate food and drink for the day and everything would be put in a rucksack with which they would also be supplied. Then when they had studied the map and decided on their route, they would be told to memorize their chosen route very well indeed. As once they started, the map would be taken away from them. The second condition was that every night they would be picked up from wherever they'd got to on the map, wherever they'd reach. They'd be taken to a hostel where they would meet their advisors once more. But the next morning, they would have to start from the same place that they had reached the previous night. So when they met their advisors at night, they would be shown the map again and they would see what they had wanted to do versus what in fact had happened. They would then be able to discuss what progress they had been made, where they had gone wrong, where they had gone right, where they had strayed from their original planned route, which part of the day's journey had gone really well, was very fun and exciting, and also what had not been so exciting, what had been challenging. They would then have to choose their route again, remembering that they had to start from where they left off and they would have to memorize the map one more time as it would be taken away before they started the next day's journey. Now, everyone was still willing to make the journey despite the strange conditions, the opportunity to experience the journey. So on the appointed morning, they all set off. Some walked very fast with purpose, intending to make the best progress possible during their first day while others dwindled and dwelled, reasoning that if they had a journey of several months before them, they didn't need to go very far each day. They could just experience things along the way. Most people decided to keep to the main road, which led away from their starting point. But one or two took some of the minor side roads, which they'd previously calculated would be shortcuts to where they wanted to go, and it would save them time. All went well for the main party until they came to the first major fork in the road. Some remembered where they had planned to go, but many had forgotten. So the parties on the road split up, going their own separate ways. The process continued at every fork in every road until there were travellers scattered all over the map, all over the wide area. 
and at the end of the first day's journey, the travellers were picked up, tired and weary, but taken to their hostel for the night, to be fed and watered and to have their planned meeting with their personal advisers. Some had kept to the main road all day and achieved exactly what they had hoped, while others had really pushed themselves hard and were in fact beyond their original planned destination for the day. But whatever had happened, all were faced with the necessity of planning for the next day and the next journey. When they met their advisors, they were shown the map again and the place that they had reached was indicated. And many realized with horror how far they had strayed from their planned route without the map. The general road led upwards and round the mountains, but many had taken side roads, which led them in a downwards direction. And so now they had to decide how to get back to where they would have been if they just followed their first original plan. They could, of course, just retrace their steps and go back to the start. Well, that would mean for many, accepting that the first day's journey had been totally wasted and none of them wanted to do that. So in most cases, they chose a rougher path to get back onto the original road. Some even chose to abandon all paths together and just scale up the hill through the tangled undergrowth in order to get back on course as quickly as possible. They soon got into the daily routine of planning, traveling, and then resting each night while surveying the progress they'd been made. They always traveled in the company of others, but usually it was with people they didn't know. Sometimes, however, they met people with whom they had traveled before and their reactions to them depended on what they remembered of the previous meeting and the previous time together on that journey. If they'd had a pleasant journey together or if the others had helped them in some way, they of course welcomed them with pleasure. But if the others had harmed them in any way, then their reactions were hostile from the beginning. Although they could do nothing to stop these people from traveling on the same road as them, in fact, they usually found that these people, and when they met these people, they would be just as hostile in return. Occasionally, they would meet a group of several people with whom they felt totally comfortable from the start, and only realized much later in that day that they'd all traveled on a good day in the past. More mystifying were the times they met someone and took an instant dislike to the person from the start. And they couldn't find out why until the end of the day when they asked their advisor, who explained that they had had a very bad experience with that person on one stage of the journey. But it was such a long time ago, they had completely forgotten about it. The travellers had realised from the very first day that there were little stalls from time to time along the road. And these stalls all proclaimed to know the best way to get to the destination. Here, come and see me. Going to paradise, we'll show you the way. For a small fee, such stalls would even give out what they claimed were very accurate maps of the area. Trust me, sir, madam, follow this map. I'll sell you a good map. However. Having brought such maps on one or two occasions in the past and having found out that the maps were only partly correct, giving a very limited view of a portion of the overall map, our travellers realised that the best way was to rely on their own memory and follow the route they had personally chosen before the start of each day. Then one day, when they were fairly advanced on their journey, they found out a remarkable fact. Before the start of the day, they'd always been given all of the tools and equipment they would likely need during that day's journey. These had been put into the rucksack and carried on his or hers back. But one day, when examining the rucksack more closely than they had done previously, one man found that it had built in a tiny two-way radio, which was tuned into the frequency of the hostel where they'd all met their advisors every night and he told the others in the party from that time onwards things become considerably easier and when they were lost they could always tune in and get advice from their own personal advisor another thing they had realized by now was they could take shortcuts from time to time without running the risks of losing themselves 
which they'd previously experienced in the early stages. So when the road snaked backwards and forwards in a mountainous stretch, they realised by doing a vertical climb to the road above on one day could save them many days travelling as the road would lead round to that spot eventually. Granted, it would mean that they had an incredibly difficult time, an incredibly difficult climb, but they would have all the equipment, all of the tools, all of the training necessary to do it. And they were able to tune in to their advisor for help. So many decided to do exactly that and voluntarily accepted one difficult day's journey in order to save many other days of time. In fact, the nearer they got to their eventual goal and the more they started to feel the buzz of excitement with the knowledge brought, the more they were likely to go for the shortcuts and do far more than they'd normally planned for one day's walk. There were another strange things that they realised after a long time on the road. A long way into that journey, they started occasionally to meet people who appeared to have a great deal of knowledge about the journey, about the whole journey and the general area, as if they themselves had already made it to the finish. Such people never told anyone that they'd already made it to the finish. They never told people what they should do but they were available to listen to their ideas and to stimulate the individual to take responsibility for their own decisions. The end of the story, of course, is that everyone eventually finished their own personal journey and found that all legends were true. And the land to which they'd come to was the paradise they'd expected. In fact, it was far better than anything they could have ever wished for. And looking back over the many months of traveling, they realized it had all been worthwhile. Now, thank you for giving me your patience, friends, as I shared that story. It's a story I know well, but I love reading direct from the book and I feel uh, my mentor Ralph very close to me when we do so. For me, then, um, that story says lots, and I'm interested to know your feelings, but I imagine that on that journey, each day is in itself perhaps a representation of an incarnation. That hostel being the place I call heaven, heaven being a place of pure energy, of pure thought, of pure love. And in fact, why would you leave such a wonderful place? Perhaps it's in pursuit of happiness and paradise. And the things that you can only experience in a 3D body and vessel. But the knowledge of those previous journeys, those previous days, those previous lights, it's not as important. Deep down at the beneath of the consciousness and personality, there is perhaps knowledge of the bigger picture. But the important thing that the travellers started to learn was, again, the importance of that day's journey and the knowledge that they were properly trained, equipped and guided for that day ahead. I think to a certain extent, it talks about soul groups, groups of people that perhaps we have incarnated with before. The idea being that your mother, your dad, your sister in this life could have been opposites. Perhaps you were the parent to your mum or you were the brother to your sister, or your second cousin twice removed. Perhaps the person you're in love with, you know, my wife, Claire, my best friend of 20 years, perhaps she was the man and I was the woman. For the body is all about the gender. I think the soul itself is genderless. Perhaps that personal advisor is our guide. And I believe that everyone has a principal guide and many of us have far more. For those involved in mediumship or giving an address or healing, no doubt you have specific guides for those purpose. And perhaps it's at the ability to remember there is an advisor and the fact that we have free will. Recognizing the finish line is perhaps milestones along the way. Recognizing that where we're meant to finish on each life, on each day of that journey is perhaps controlled with an element of destiny but the way we get to our destiny the paths we take is all down to our free will and the life we choose may not be the life we live but often it will go in the way it's exactly meant to be and it's difficult for us to understand that 
and to understand that concept of choosing a life which is difficult. But it may only be with the benefit of multiple days on the road that we chose to experience what we did. And perhaps the day that we saw someone fall and trip down the hill, we said, I'd like to understand exactly what they went through. So tomorrow, I'm going to see what it feels like to fall. Perhaps if they laughed and found it amusing, they want to feel and experience the next day what it's like for someone to laugh at them. The more we think about the lives, the harder it becomes to understand every single decision. Most of the time, I'm very happy in my life, but I do struggle at times to overcome depression and anxiety, low moods, particularly at this time, who isn't experiencing some of those low moods at the moment? The idea of understanding it right now perhaps isn't as important, perhaps I was at a higher place to understand those experiences. And when I think about some of the most difficult things in my life, and when I think about other people's lives and the different things they experience, as the human being, Ashley Robinson, I find it very hard to believe that anyone would choose certain things. There's so many horrific things in the world, so many to talk about. Something like child cancer. Why would you choose to experience that? I don't know. And I don't believe I'm meant to know right now. And perhaps you were never meant to experience it in that life. But the experience in itself was something you're grateful for. I also think that those familiar groups, once you have a good journey and a good day on the road, why wouldn't you choose to do the next day and the next journey with those people? And perhaps some of those old wise minds along the way, perhaps they enjoyed the experience so much. That was why they started popping up to provide a bit of help. And those people at the stalls, perhaps they're representations of religion, philosophy, of culture, people that believe they've absolutely got it right and they've done a map and all they want to do is help you reach paradise. But of course, like you, they only have the memories that they were left with. So in a nutshell, I believe in the concept of reincarnation. I believe that the important thing now is about the journey we're on, experiencing, hopefully, love, unconditional love, people that love us and people that we love in pursuit of happiness, doing things with those people we love, doing things that we love. That, I believe, is very important. And at a higher sort of self level, everything that I found difficult, once I get through that, I try and look back. I try and if people have particularly upset me or wronged me, I try and find the courage to forgive them. And after that, I know that the next process is getting to the point of thanking them for that experience. And I haven't quite mastered that one all of the time, but I know that it would certainly help me with not holding a grudge. Recognizing the fact that perhaps when I was planning the next day's journey, it was a trusted friend I asked to help me go through that experience in the first place. Perhaps there's one of the better words, a soul contract between the two of us to experience those things. And sometimes there'll be the highs of unconditional love, of meeting your soul mate. Sometimes it'll be the lows. So friends, that's my knowledge and understanding of uh, reincarnation. Um, I'll see if there's any questions uh, in the chat room, but I am very much encourage you now to either ask me some, some questions about my belief or to add some additional context um, or whether or not you want to share any of your own memories. So I can't see anything, Lawrence, in the, uh, in the chat room. There's nothing at the moment, as always. The first one is always the hardest one to ask. Uh, it's, it's a bit like opening the floodgates. Once, <laughs> the once somebody's gone first and everybody follows. Brilliant story, Ashley. I absolutely love that. The way that was put out, that was really encapsulated so much. We, we tend to sort of like pick on an aspect of reincarnation and not look at the overall picture of it. So that's, well, that's why I really love that uh, story because that brought everything into it. You know, we, we do, we get very hung up sometimes on past lives. I mean, in my opinion is I'm having enough trouble with this life. I'm not worried <laughs> about the other ones, you know. <laughs> so if anybody has got any comments, please you can just raise your hands or 
in either in the participants bar or on screen i am monitoring yeah and yeah i do, I do encourage uh, your friends to i mean challenge me if you uh, if if you think that uh, you know i've said something which you don't agree with and if you're interested in the concept of karma i could always um, plant a couple of seeds on that but um paula asks is the book available to buy yes yes it is um so it's called a practical spiritual primer it's one of a, a series of books written by by Ralph A. Steadman. I say, uh, sadly for me, the, the physical incarnation of Ralph is no longer with us. He's, uh, he's in heaven, uh, but his books are still available to buy. You can actually get them in, uh, you know, in secondhand shops, but I've seen a few for sale on, on eBay and, and Amazon and other bits and pieces. Um, it's also carried by a lot of churches. So Ralph was based in the, the sort of Southwest uh, and lots of spiritualist churches still carry his books. And uh, we'll hopefully be able to open the doors again soon for some of these spiritual bookshops. But we've got a couple in Wimbledon, too. Um, this is my favourite one of his books. Um, I think it was Julie that reminded me. He, he often said he wrote them in the wrong order. Um, but um, he uh, he's written some lovely things. OK, we do have a uh, another question here from Sarah's iPhone. Do you believe we can access our previous lives via regression? Yes, yeah, uh, yes, I do. It goes back to that concept, uh, you know, thinking about the story as each day's journey being a, a separate life, then I believe that um, what makes up our consciousness and our personality now, uh, to a certain extent, uh, deep within uh, our, our inner self, is that knowledge of the previous day's journey or, or the previous lives. Uh, I think it's one of the conditions of living the life you live now is that you're not meant to have sort of general access to it. But I also believe it's not forbidden. And either through, you know, evolving yourself spiritually, through attuning in your own sort of spiritual work and, and meditation, you can get there. Now, I've uh, I've undertaken past life regression, sometimes through meditation, uh, sometimes uh, through more of a hypnosis state. And uh, a bit like mediumship, unless you're going absolutely uh, mad and you're hearing voices, then you do start to get sort of evidence um, as uh, that you can go and research and, and, and check in on. Now, there's some lovely meditations you can find online if you Google them, where you can kind of take yourself through various steps. Lots of them involve bits of journey backwards, you know, down winding staircases and, and sort of going backwards. And you can control this in a very sort of conscious state where you start to ask yourself about yourself. And really a bit like mediumship in, in the early days of training, challenge that knowledge, you know, what was my name? Where was I born? Try and get sort of specific information and sort of details uh, from it. So yeah, good, good question. Yeah, I do believe it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, I also believe that uh, for some of us, we might be incarnating for the first time. Uh, so you might not be able to go too far back. Now I have uh, relatively good uh, authority on the fact that there are people incarnating as human beings for the first time. Uh, equally, there are people that have now done tens of thousands of lives. So while I do believe that reincarnation is possible, I don't think it's an absolute. I don't think you have to reincarnate. I think you can live one life and uh, you know retire quite happily with your cottage by the sea if that's what you want heaven to be. Equally, I think you can go back multiple times and do it again over a huge period of time. Lovely. Joe Butler's asking, do you believe that our journeys are planned to such specific details such as you mentioned child cancer or that you choose an experience and our physical bodies manifest then okay. so i believe in in destiny and i believe that certain things are within our destiny so i'm just looking around and trying to make a, a judgment call on age uh, if i talk about blockbuster video does everyone know what i'm talking about there's not too many youngsters amongst us <laughs> that that. um but yeah so imagine then that you're in heaven and you've got the equivalent of blockbuster video and as an incarnation as a as a consciousness you can walk into blockbuster and you think right what do i fancy next now, just assume that there was only a handful of options and you decide on your incarnation, right, I can be a man or a woman, or it's 2021 now, I could perhaps be a born a man that wants to be a woman or a woman that wants to be identifying as a man. You know, there's lots of perhaps options, but let's assume you can choose man or woman. And then you decide perhaps if you're going to be born in a hot part of the world or a cold part of the world. Are you going to be born to a family with money or without money? Are you going to be born into a family where the pregnancy is very healthy, a very strong womb and, and strong sort of physical health? Are you going to choose more of a weaker health? 
Are you going to be born to a family that have been wanting you as a baby to come a long time? Or are you going to come into a family by a bit of surprise? Now, we've only mentioned just a couple of the properties, but imagine you could walk through Blockbuster choosing every aspect of it. That's why there would be so many ways of doing this so many times and why none of us are absolutely identical. We've all still got that sort of uniqueness. And I think that just assuming then it's blockbuster and you've got your, your videotape, your DVD, perhaps you have a very quick look at that. It's the equivalent of maybe the trailer. Oh, Ashley Robinson, that sounds a bit of a right. And rather than watch the whole film, which is the life, you almost download the trailer and you see the highlights. And you think, oh, someone there, oh, he's going to have a little bit of poor health. He's going to put on a lot of weight, but he's got parents that love him. And he re-meets with someone that he's previously met and falls in love and eventually has children after 10 years. And you think, oh, that, that all sounds quite good. Um, and you think, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one out and I'll give it a go. Of course, the trailer is now just a distant memory. So how you get to the destiny is sort of like, well, what was the most important thing about that life? What was it you chose to experience? Was it the fact that you just wanted to be a man this time because you'd been a woman? Was it that you'd been born? into uh, a life uh, and a relationship that after you'd lived it, you decided to do something different? Because knowing my own understanding of things now why wouldn't i go into blockbusters and say right i want to be a bloke i want to be born into a really rich family where i never have to do a day sort of physical work in my life i want my mum and dad to be you know super rich people where i get everything i want and then you live that life and you think this is great this is i can do whatever i want whenever i want you've got servants and people that do all these wonderful things for you and they carry you through life and you never really want for anything and um, actually, you decide that you're going to you know, start to maybe take on a bit of the family business and you go into that world and you don't really care about other people because it's all about you. Now, imagine this new human being, let's call them Newman, gets to the end of that life and they're watching the playback, the highlights on the reel and they go, really, was I... I was kind of mean, actually. Those those wonderful servants, I, I exploited them. I didn't really pay them much money, and they, they worked those horrible conditions just to better for me. Right, I want to do this again. I want to go back, and this time I want to be the servant in that family. I want to see what it was like to be on the other end of me. So perhaps it works like that. Or perhaps you live the life of the rich man in the beautiful home and the, the family. You think, oh, I've experienced everything I needed to do in a third dimensional world. And then you say in heaven, right, I'm ready to progress. I'm ready to see what this heaven is all about. And I want to become an ascended master and give all these human beings uh, some infinite wisdom. And perhaps someone taps you on the shoulder and says, you haven't experienced enough yet to, to help everybody. Now, that for me was the glossy sort of version of that. And I haven't specifically answered the question because why would you choose to either be a child with cancer or the parent of a child in cancer or a doctor that helps a child through that cancer? I can't understand that because I don't have the physical uh, mentality to understand why you would. Uh, to quote sort of Stephen Fry that talks about the fact he doesn't really believe in God, but if there was one, he would say, oh, God, child cancer, you know, what's what's that all about? And of course, I don't necessarily see God as a single person. For me, God is more of a, a collective uh, energy of, of the divine presence of that is heaven. But child cancer, it's horrific, isn't it? Why? Why would we understand that? Is it a condition of Earth? Is it because of radiation and the way that we look after this planet and therefore not part of destiny, but something that is just experienced? And at the end of all those experiences, you go back and you try and see what you learned from it. The empathy, the sympathy, the physical pain and how to confront it. Perhaps they were important things. And, you know, when I asked Ralph, who I used to think is a real guru and oracle, this sort of stuff, it said to me, well, let's assume that you was the child that had the cancer and died. Perhaps that experience of being cared for by wonderful parents and cared for by the nursing, perhaps that would inspire you and to come back to earth and be a nurse or be a doctor or to be the scientist that's going to be part of a team that's going to make another investment into conquering this you know, criminality behind cancer. Perhaps that experience is going to inspire you to choose that life and go down as that doctor. So perhaps there's some of the symptoms of Earth, which aren't part of true destiny, but really a consequence of a symptom of living the lives the way we do. And therefore, the destiny element is what you come back for. And perhaps you weren't able to experience everything. 
And the reason I say that is because of free will. So if our destiny was to live a long, healthy life to the ripe age of 95, and you come back with that knowledge and you decide to take up a hobby which includes jumping in front of trains, you're perhaps not going to live to the 95. And it's free will that controls your decisions to jump in front of a train. And actually, you might think, do you know what? If one of those trains hits me, I'll just come back and do it again. So perhaps there are lots of reasons why we're not meant to know all of this. But I think destiny is just a part of it. How we get there, the decisions and free will in the middle, that's what influences. So, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. You're on mute, Lawrence. Sorry. That's going to be the tagline of this generation, isn't it? You're <laughs> on mute. Uh, Carl's asking, what is it that incarnates? Interesting. So I, I believe, as I, as I talk, spoke about the human being and the corpse, after you have finished with your human body, which I call the vessel, the machine, the car, whatever you want to call it, I believe it's the personality of the person. Some people call that the soul or the spirit. I like the word personality. It sums up all of those ingredients we kind of chose. So the personality is what survives and lives a life after life. That's our knowledge of life after death. As a spiritualist medium, I believe it's that personality that communicates with me and my guides to give evidence of their life after life. And I believe it is that personality that lives in heaven, a place of pure energy. They are pure energy as a personality. They live in a place called heaven of pure energy, the spirit world. And it's at that point that they decide to incarnate, where they choose another vessel. And particularly on Earth, which some people talk about the, the training planet, but the idea of going down to Earth as a human being and incarnating again, it's the personality taking on that, uh, that human body. Now, I just want to add one other bit to that story, which is that I mentioned uh, very briefly, my wife and I tried for kids for 10 years. And while trying, we had a couple of uh, situations, miscarriages or what the hospital would call failed pregnancies. And I had a question about the point of incarnation. Now, from my own questions to spirit and evidence afterwards is that at the point of conception starts the point of incarnation. But the physical body of the baby as it develops possibly needs five to six months of enough capacity inside the brain for the personality to fully start to absorb that physical self, where it then blends with the spiritual self, the physical body, and the other sort of layers. But it's at that point of incarnation, that point of conception, that the personality starts to blend with that body. And that's what I believe. Very good, very good. Joe Butler's asking, uh, do you believe that our journeys, oh, no, we've just had that, beg your pardon, there we go, Claire, beg your pardon, Claire's wondering when she's been somewhere, got the sense that they've actually been somewhere before, but they know it's the first time, do you think there is an element of reincarnation with that, sort of deja vu? Yeah, deja vu. I mean, um, Hollywood and the Matrix have a, an idea for this. Is a There's a glitch in the system, um, <laughs> for those of you that have seen the, the Matrix film, which um, is, is a brilliant film. But ha if you look at it again as a spiritualist, there's, there's a few spiritual uh, undertones in that film. I think that, yeah, deja vu could be exactly that. Uh, when I've asked Spirit and my own guides, I've had a couple of different answers. Uh, the first thing is that you remember when I spoke about Blockbuster and watching the trailer. Perhaps it's you remembering the trailer. OK, if you've been into Blockbuster, you've watched the trailer. And then in that moment, you think, oh, I remember that from the trailer. That was one of the reasons I wanted to do. So it could be something really significant. It was one of the highlights in the film. It could be that you'd kind of seen the whole film. You'd watched it you know, very quickly. You'd read the synopsis and you were remembering that. Um, and that's what I believe. I think that certainly that familiarity of places, I think that you could have well been there. Um, you're, you're, you're based in Paul on you. So I mean, I'm just trying to think ships, a historic shipyard down in Portsmouth. I went on to uh, HMS Victory with a friend of mine, uh, Zach, uh, who lives in California. And he had a really difficult time down on that ship. And uh, he actually said to me, he was only a young, young lad at the time, maybe eight or nine years old. And he had said to me that he had died on that ship 
you didn't even know this ship existed as, as Zach uh, the American. And uh, it was through different bits of regression much afterwards. He believed he'd actually died as a as a sailor on that ship. And it, it, it wasn't until he got there that it brought back uh, the memory. So I think, yeah, sometimes that familiarity of of people, of being there, it's an element of, of perhaps doing that in a, in a past life that's now influenced the personality we have uh, today. Um, for those that don't know me very well, I've I've had a stroke. In fact, I've had a, a couple of strokes, uh, sadly, now. And when I spoke to my neurologist about um, my uh, belief in the power of prayer, which is one of the things I think helped me uh, overcome my stroke, I spoke about deja vu. And as a neurologist, he said, that's just your eyes not catching up with your brain and, you know, and, and sort of understanding it. So you've, you're kind of you, that glitch from Matrix where you're just seeing something and then it's replaying very quickly. But I said to him, well, how does that, why does that then interfect my intuition or my instinct to my, my gut feeling and he didn't have an answer for that and it was later that day that when he explained to me I'd killed one third of my brain cells and probably should have died and I asked him what did he do and he sounded more spiritual than he'd done ever at all because he said you know what you had a spontaneous recovery and I said what's that he said that's where there was no human intelligence involved in what happened and we kind of just left it at that. So, yeah, neurologist science, I think that science and religion are probably closer now than they would care to admit. Uh, in fact, uh, there's this wonderful little story of a, you know, a person called science and a person called religion. And at the beginning, at the dawn of time, religion and science had an awful lot in common, but they then had a disagreement. So they turned around and they tried to get as far away from each other as possible. And as they walked around the circumference of the earth, it wasn't until they got halfway around the earth, they thought, at last, religion and science has never been so far apart. And they carried on their journey only to come back and meet. And if we use that circumference of the Earth as a timeline, I think that the era we're in now, the age of, a, of Aquarius, is a time of religion and science and metaphysics are coming back together to look for the science to underpin this. And, you know, even at GCSE Science, it was my teacher that told me that everything was made of atoms and atoms had particles and particles were, in fact, an intelligence and intelligence energy and that I couldn't do anything to destroy energy you can't it's a scientific uh, you know rule uh, and that particles can be in more than one place at the same time particles can be in continuous communication with other particles on different sides of the planet and if it will if it GCSE science they can tell us about that then they'll start to have a lot more understanding about this I'm sure excellent <clears throat> I love that science and <laughs> story thank you i was going to stick <laughs> paul is asking she's saying as a child she kept having a recurring dream where she was in water with a half sunken boat in front of her but she wasn't afraid could that be the way that i passed she's saying last time or a time could be i don't think there's there's always an exact science uh, to this it could be um, that your, 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 your personality is more wary of water. Uh, it could be that uh, your personality or your previous life, perhaps you there as a lifeguard or a member of the Coast Guard or the R&I &E, and you'd seen people die at sea. So it done something to your ability to understand risk. It could be that your guides or inspirers or your spirit friends are, are cautious of, of water uh, and therefore that they're inspiring you through your sort of intuition. I do think that um, there's lots of evidence to suggest that our previous lives can influence our, our sort of current life. Um, I've also heard from people that perhaps have physical marks on their body where they believe they were perhaps shot with an arrow or a bullet in, in sort of previous lives. And perhaps it's someone's way of trying to help them remember that map. You know, going back to the hostel and you think, well, what am I going to do to remember that? It wasn't very good when I got shot with that arrow by my best friend on the horse behind me. How can I, you know, mark that moment and sort of remember it? Oh, in that life, I'm going to just choose a little birthmark to remind me in the same way that people tie bits of string around them so yeah absolutely I, I do think it's possible uh, but I do think that also one of the conditions of living this life in incarnation is that we're not directly influenced uh, by by that previous life. Sue Townsend asking to use a common term at the moment do you feel people in a soul group come together before they are born into human form whereby the they agree to go through particular circumstances together perhaps murder or similar, which is considered a violation on earth and challenging for all concerned. 
However, in the realm of spirit is a huge act of unconditional love currently beyond the understanding of most humanity. Yeah, great. To, I mean, nice to have you uh, on here, Sue, as well. Great question. Um, I do believe it's uh, it's possible. And I spoke about soul groups uh, maybe traveling uh, together. And I think that when people talk about meeting their soulmate or their best friend, uh, that that love, um, that unconditional love can be so powerful that that can transfer through through many lives. And I think that certainly there are people uh, you, you bump into and rub into in life that you don't want anything to do with that are going to make you cross the road that you can't stomach. Perhaps it's a it's a similar influence so i do think that there are there is such a concept of, of soul groups uh, and i do think it's possible uh, going back to that thing around child cancer you know, let's pick a really bad character in history adolf hitler now who could believe that from the from the spirit world that would have been even one of the dvds allowed in blockbuster let alone a life that involved that kind of destiny again with my current understanding i find it difficult to to believe um Perhaps um, some might say, and there's been some beautiful spiritual teachings about the Second World War. I think Zodiac and uh, and the Greater World, Lawrence, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. My dad would always know these things, but spoke about the fact that World War II almost needed to happen in a way because World War One wasn't resolved properly in terms of defeating not just Hitler, but the evil that was behind the sort of the Nazis of empire and the Nazi party. There was an evil there which needed to be defeated. And the, you know, spirits have often given lots of evidence around the fact that, well, we don't want people to take lives and go through those experiences in terms of overcoming an evil that was, you know, destroying humanity. It was very, very important. Uh, there were lots of evidence of, uh, of mediums working during the Second World War who were guided by, by spirit. Uh, there's a medium, I remember reading one of their books, where they walked through the Blitz uh, in the middle of the night, totally unscathed as bits of London were hurt because they were told to go out by spirit and that they would be safe. They needed to see what was happening uh, as, part of, uh, as part of that fuel. So yes, I do think that most of what we can understand as a 3D human being in this, in this third dimensional world, it's, it's difficult, it's incredibly difficult to understand. Understand. But I do think that things that have happened, perhaps there is a greater reason and, and understanding to that. And then something like murder. OK, so I'm just going to make a, a hypothetical assumption. Let's say you lived a terrible life, a really terrible life, and you did kill someone. And you get to the end of the life and you end up in a prison of your own making because your higher self is so disappointed that you committed a murder. Perhaps one of the ways you get yourself out of that prison is by saying that you want to see the impact. Perhaps you're now gonna go back and you're gonna be someone that is murdered. And perhaps you find the person you've murdered and as part of that apology and saying sorry and understanding forgiveness and thanking for that experience, you say, I want to understand it. And the person says, I've just been murdered. The last thing I wanna do is go back and take a life. But perhaps there is this concept of a soul contract or perhaps it ends up becoming your friend or your guide that says, OK, you want to experience that. That's what we're going to do. We're going to set up so you can go through it. Um, or perhaps you're going to come back as a counsellor and you're going to counsel that family. You're going to help with the, with the healing. Now, I only believe in one afterlife. So for me, there's a life after this life and I call it heaven. I call it the spirit world. Within heaven, although I believe it's only one place, I do think there are various levels of perhaps frequency or dimension to it for want of a better words, many houses within the mansion that's heaven, uh, which is almost a biblical quote, but not quite uh, right. Uh, as Jesus speaks about my father creating, you know, there are many houses in my father's mansion, something like that. So that for me, you know, Adolf Hitler lives the life he lives, gets to heaven, doesn't suddenly get the little cottage by the side of the sea to retire in where everyone thanking him for that experience. It was a very evil, dangerous person. That man's going to be taken to one side and if not in a prison of his own making in a prison of some sort. Now that's my human understanding in, in common English. I don't believe that he, heaven is a freely place, but let's assume as part of that working, Hitler needs to evolve. He certainly built a lot of karmatic debt and there is no way that he's going to progress in order to go forward. Um, so, yeah, someone like Hitler is going to have to work off that debt. He's going to have to learn and educate. He's going to have to invest uh, in himself. So, yeah, absolutely, Sue. I do agree with you. Some of this stuff is just beyond the understanding of humanity. I don't think we're meant to get it all. But I do think there's an element of education and investment. When we start to understand it. And, yeah, soul groups. Um, perhaps we ask those people to do it. 
and to, to, to have loved and to lost, they say, is better than to have never loved it at all. And perhaps, you know, the same way that you would do anything for a good friend now, why wouldn't you in heaven? If they really want to understand, you know, let's take an accident as opposed to murder. If you accidentally run someone over and killed them and you live with that all of your life and you got to the end of your life and you still feel that you hadn't learnt enough about that experience, perhaps it's that you feel that you, you wanted to go back and you want to be run over. Now, I can't imagine, because I just don't have that understanding, that someone say, oh, yeah, there's a life there and they need to run someone over as part of their experience. I don't think it works like that. But perhaps you say, do you know what? If it's going to happen, I'll do it for you, mate. You know, and I know that you want to do this to understand it. And in the same way, we do favours for each other now. Why wouldn't we do that as a soul group and to go back? And of course, with love, if you're lucky enough to fall in love and experience that, why wouldn't you want it again? You know, I've not been to every part of the world, uh, but I've been to the same place more than once. You know, let's take a theme park. You know, growing up as a kid, there was a theme park near us called Chesington World of Adventures. And uh, there were favourite places in Chesington that I'd always go back to each time, regardless of the fact that there might have been new rides. So, of course, why wouldn't we do that with our lives and our choices? So thanks for that, uh, Sue. Good question. Sam Nurse is asking, uh, do you think the lives we live are linear? Are we aiming towards something or an end goal? Yes and no. Right. So yes, uh, in the sense of, of science and karmatic debt, they were working towards something, uh, a greater a greater presence, a, a higher level of frequency. Now, when I spoke about heaven being a place of, of pure energy, I think one of the reasons as human beings we think about it being above or up is because it's a higher frequency, it's a higher dimension, a higher level. Uh, I think to, to a certain extent, the idea of evolving within that place I call heaven, becoming, you know, an ascended master of some sort that can come back and educate uh, people, perhaps live a, a really, you know, big in sort of impactful life. Um, there is an element of progressing within that. So, yes, there's an opportunity to, to do it. But just like the story, um, perhaps um, you, you're not going to do it in that order. Perhaps you end up going backwards and falling down the sideways and you, you have moments where you go sideways and backwards. It isn't always an onwards, upwards uh, sort of projection. Perhaps you start your life, off, your life off, you know, in that poor family with a fragile pregnancy, with a parent that dies, you know, early in your life where you have to work five jobs just to make ends meet. Otherwise, the new human starts in the very posh life. So perhaps they pass, you know, like ships at night and they change those lives. So, yes, linear, but I don't think it's an exact rule. I think that people can almost choose and at sometimes have little control in it. Lovely. Julie's asking, do you think we could be living multiple lives at the same time? Old uh, Julie uh, always asks me difficult questions on, on these things. <laughs> uh, yes, is, is the answer. I, I think it's possible. Now, my, my metaphysics and uh, knowledge of science just isn't enough to really understand it, but it goes back to that principle of particles. So science tells us that beneath the atoms is the particles, lots of particles flying around. Is it a, a proton, a newton, something like that? I wish I would paid more attention at school now. I wish someone like Ralph Steadman actually te teach me at school. It would have helped a lot. But we know those particles are in constant communication with each other and other particles. We know that the same particle can exist in one atom and another atom at exactly the same time. So, yes, it's possible. Now, my knowledge in this life is of Earth. <laughs> As a human being, uh, the uh, universe is constantly expanding. They say that, you know, for every decision you make, there could be even a parallel universe to that. Now, there's an awful lot of fantasy and sci-fi from Hollywood that goes into then start to be talking about that side of the world. It'd need an entire another show. You know, my ancient aliens theory and all sorts of stuff uh, would need to come into that. But yes, I think it is possible. But I also think about it, um, going back to that lineal terms, about the personality being like water. OK, so I've got a bottle of water here. Let's call this bottle the human being. OK, here's the vessel. Inside is the water. The water is the personality and the consciousness. Once I'm finished with the bottle, the personality, the consciousness has got to go somewhere. I believe it goes to heaven. Let's call heaven the giant washing up bowl of liquid. So everyone's personality gets poured back into that giant bowl in heaven. Now, all the liquid is together. 
and it's flowing together, but individually, the atoms and the particles still maintain its own fingerprint, its own identity. And someone would be able to come along with the right scoop and still scoop out that personality. So I believe that is how we then incarnate. Someone would say, well, no, because when that energy joins the great energy, the divine, the personality now has influence of other energy and other particles. And perhaps it is therefore possible to be living multiple lives. And the last part of answering that question, I'd finish as a medium. Because someone would say, if the consciousness and personality is giving you a message, you know, so for example, you've got my granddad talking to you right now from heaven, giving me evidence he's life after life. That means my granddad hasn't reincarnated yet. Now, as a layman, yes, I believe that's the way it works. Because the personality is in heaven, communicating with me through my guides down to you, giving you evidence of life after life. Therefore, it follows that they haven't yet incarnated into another human being. Some people would say, well, if you think about that water analogy and the water joining the great pool of the divine, perhaps it's only part of the personality that goes back down to reincarnate and part of the personality stays in heaven forever able to communicate. Perhaps it's almost like an umbilical cord, a spiritual umbilical cord back to something greater. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Robert Barron is asking, could it be that the memory of a past life is indeed a memory of a spirit close to you? I think that almost anything is, is possible. Um, I was watching a fascinating uh, documentary. I say fascinating, unless you're a, a big spiritual sort of science geek like me, you might not find it fascinating. But it was a neurologist looking into the study of, of the brain. And it actually started off by talking about people like Notre Dame. And one of the explanations from this scientist around clairvoyance was that it was psychic, it was an ESP level. You're not actually giving evidence of, uh, of someone's life after life. What you're really doing as a clairvoyant is you're, you're using te some sort of te telepathy to read the memory of the person that lived with the person that's there. And I think to a certain extent, you could say, well, maybe that's true. And you've got you know, stage magicians like Darren Brown that can do similar things with, with reading minds. But for me, when spirit come through and give evidence of their life after life, it almost always comes with a message. And that message is unique. Sometimes it's a simple, um, I'm okay, tell your mum I loved you. Often it's things that they, they don't even know. It's a direction, perhaps, if they're asking for that sort of guidance. And again, I think, well, unless that's my own inner self uh, doing that. So going back to the specific question around that uh, as a sort of dead memory of a spirit close to you, perhaps that's part of it. Um, but I do think that um, actually talking about the, the past life, the regression, um, it could well be that uh, that is a life uh, you've lived. And um, I'm playing devil's advocate because you know, I have started uh, develop, you know, continuing to develop my, my mediumship. And one of the things that I've put my, my guides through is a bit of an inquisition when they come through and evidencing who they are. And actually, the guides that work with me as my kind of inspirers and my teachers give similar evidence to um, the evidence I found through past life regression about my past life. So is my past life regression really just a deeper understanding of a guide or a closer guide? Or is it that guides in themselves are also past lives? And actually, if you think about heaven as that place of pure energy, then it's their personality. So, you know, let's take a, a guide. I'm going to make this guide. I'll give a stereotypical guide. We've got a red Indian guide, you know, cloud five that's given us that evidence. It's their personality. The, the life they lived as, as the Native American Indian cloud doesn't really mean anything to them now because it's just their personality which survives, which in itself is a past life. So perhaps that's why they're so close. Brilliant, brilliant. Sarah's asking, do you believe we agree to so-called karmic debt? If so, is it just for learning, not payback? <laughs> I think um, you know, we said if we had time, we would uh, we'd plant a seed, didn't we, about uh, karma. Um, I do believe in karma. I believe what you put out there is is kind of what you get back. Um, sometimes I think it's like a, a boomerang and it's instantaneous. And, you know, you send out love and light, you get love and light back. And it, it, it can work in that instantaneous manner. Uh, sometimes I think that the concept of a, of a karmatic debt uh, is exactly that. Now, several mediums... Um, that have spoken to me, I've spoke about that evolution in heaven. 
Okay, some people are advanced enough to talk about the various dimensions that perhaps even exist uh, in heaven, which which can be quite deep and quite difficult to understand. Some of you may well have that knowledge and that might explain that you've lived you know, more lives than, than me. But assuming that in order to progress within heaven, you need to become purer and lighter, then there's an element of your personality picking up this debt. And the way I think about it is like hats. OK, so I live the life of Ashley Robinson. When I die, my body's finished. But as a personality, I'm still wearing the, the hat of Ashley Robinson. And when I want to evolve to the next stage, they're going to look at that hat. And it's the idea of weighing yourself up, isn't it, in, in heaven? And actually look at that hat and go, yeah, Ashley Robinson, in general terms, you lived a good life. I look at all the good things you've done versus the bad things. Perhaps I'm even looking at myself and I can take this hat off and know that this hat will now just disappear. It is no longer part of you. I do think that lots of the really positive things you do can give you that brownie points, can give you that kind of worth. Equally, I think it's only you that can truly forgive yourself and those people that you've hurt and harmed against you. Uh, which is why that you know I spoke earlier on didn't I, about my son who was also being brought up Catholic and spiritualist. There's some interesting conversations around the concept of confession because I don't believe that just a religious person can forgive you. I think the person you've wronged against has to forgive you. So Ashley Robinson's hat. If I've done lots of really bad things, for me you'd get to some type of doorkeeper or bouncer at that dimension, and they'd go right. Let's have a look at that hat. Oh, I don't like the look of that. Looks like you've done a lot of naughty things. You've done a lot of wrong things. I can see on the other hand, you've done a lot of good things, but that hat's just too big. You ain't going to get in. You ain't going to be able to get through this portal. I'm not going to let you in. And I think to a certain extent, some people talk about limbo and the spirit world or limbo into the spirit world and different levels within that. But I think that the more wrongdoing you've done in your incarnation, this debt becomes like tar. It's not just a hat you can take off. We spoke about Adolf Hitler covered in black tar is not progressing. That black tar is holding him down. Particularly, that's why we maybe think about hell being lower, a lower vibration. That energy is negative. It needs to be cleared up. And someone comes along to someone like Adolf Hitler and says, you're going to need to do it again. And you're going to need to get rid of that tar. So you have to go back and then you, you does a new life, does a new day on the journey, comes back. Actually, you've accumulated more tar. Back you go again. Right, I'm going to do it differently this time. And eventually you get to a point where you start to tip the balance. And he said, you know what? You've taken more tar off this time than you've gained. You're in the right direction, but you do it again. And perhaps that's the concept behind thousands of incarnations, because it's only once you've got rid of all that negative energy, all of that negative karma, you get to the point where you're light enough, and you're transparent enough, you are more unconditional love that you can progress and progress upwards. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. One last question here from Denise. Do you believe you bring forward from past lives into this one? Well, I think we've probably just covered that part. Yeah, I, I think you do. I don't think it's an absolute that you must. Uh, I do think that it's possible that you can. And I do think it influences perhaps the, the decisions. So one of the things I do believe about incarnation is it's it's not a roulette wheel that you spin and you just hope for a red or black. I do think there's an element of you being able to choose, perhaps choosing the date, the time that you're born. Uh, I spoke to a wonderful lady, Kate May, yesterday about astrology and the tarot. Perhaps you choose a particular time that the moon is just right and you know, cancer is into Leo, into a full moon. Perhaps you choose that moment. You because of the personality you want, the life you want to live. I do think there are elements, if you send where you want to be born in the world to the parents you're born. But of course, once you're here, you have no choice over that. You've had no um, obvious choice anyway. Perhaps it was in that place we call heaven. Yeah, I, I very much agree on the astrology side. Um, I think it is a big part of our makeup because if we, you know, I always say, if you're going to do a trip to Scotland, you're not going to go out and buy a moped. You're going to buy a vehicle that will suit the journey. So when we're planning this journey on this plane of existence, let's not talk about other planes. <laughs> you, you need it. You know, if you're going to be a great orator, you, you, you can't be a timid, shy wallflower. If you're going to be whatever you're in, whatever you do, whatever you achieve or whatever challenges you've chosen, is part and parcel of the physical makeup and how you're going to react and handle that. And a lot of that does, you know, a lot of people probably won't go along the astrology route, but 
I find a lot of insight with astrology and people and places. Definitely, yeah. Ashley, what a brilliant night. Thank, thank you, it's been you. a pleasure to be here. Ah, no, absolutely brilliant. I'm sure you'd all like to thank Ashley for uh, giving us some really good information, a lot to take away and think about, and confirmation or denial of what we were thinking. Thank you all for joining us. It's so nice to see many people in the room. <clears throat> Quick rundown of what's happening down here in Paul. Tomorrow morning at 10.45, we have our Zoom service. And tomorrow we have uh, Erwin. <laughs> Gone blank. Uh, bear with me, everybody. Oh, God, never act with animals or Lawrence. There we go. Ewan Irvin. Not Irvin Ewan, Ewan Irvin will be taking our divine service on Zoom tomorrow morning at 10.45. 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we have a live service here within the church. People who are local to the area, more than welcome to attend, it is allowed, and that will be taken by Tony Goswell. We have meditations Monday night, 7 p.m., Saturday morning at 9 a.m. On Wednesday night, we have a Lyceum night, and we're talking spiritualism in the COVID era with Kate Green. She's from Manchester area, has served the church on a couple of occasions. And they're another batch of people who are really going for it with the online and the in-church experience. So we'll be talking about her journey at this time. And next Saturday at seven o'clock, live on the church Facebook page, we're going to have an introduction to shamanism with Gillian Schofield. So quite a lot coming up there this week. Also, don't forget, as Ashley has mentioned, there's a lot going on. Spiritual Psychic TV channel, is it not on YouTube? Yeah, um, on YouTube, Spiritual Psychic TV. And they've got a fan page on, on Facebook, which gives you notifications, but um, some great free content and a real varied uh, panel of people. Yeah, and it is these times, especially, uh, the more we can learn, and the more we can put out there and just stimulate the mind and keep people active and thinking and coming together in these ways. So again, thank you all for joining us. Ashley, greatly indebted to you again for taking one of our evenings. Thank you, thank you so much. It's we, a pleasure. We Great do that pay people have been interested in, in philosophy. We've had uh, so many people want to listen in. So thank you, folks. Yeah. We do pay expenses, uh, travel <laughs> expenses. So if you pop those bad. in the post. <laughs> we wish everybody a very safe and peaceful good evening. Thank you again for joining us. Lovely seeing people. Uh, feel free to unmute if you wish to have a quick natter. Please do. Stay safe and healthy, folks. Thank, Thank you very much, Ashley. Thank, Thank you, Ashley. Ashley. Thank you. Bye bye. Lovely to meet you bye -bye. all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Ashley. Thank you very much. Thanks for everything. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to talk to you about, but I couldn't. You wanted to ask a question? No, I've got some quite a lot of experience myself in that sort of thing and i wanted more of a discussion but it just wasn't available here we'll have to um come back and uh, and do it again um <laughs> we ended up getting lo lots of lovely questions which was great but um yeah be, be good to hear from other people's uh, uh experiences too so if you set up another chat show or whatever you like to call it i will be quite happy to join in Lovely. Okay, Sarah, we'll keep that in mind. Please keep an eye out on both all the pages, the Wimbledon Church page as well, for any future events coming up. Yeah, indeed. It is a, a subject that's very close to my heart. Yep, look forward to learning. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good night, Sarah. Good night. I was just wondering your thoughts, Ashley. I think I've mentioned this to you before. Um, I do the spirit board um, and we've got a guy called George that comes through who I know a bit of his history and that and uh, 
he we was asking him um do, do was we meant to sort of bump into you and c- communicate through the board or you know all these sort of questions we've been asking him and um one thing he gave us was when we asked him this was um he he would be from like um the late 1800s we've sort of got from him um and he said to us is um like because we asked him if was it destiny would are we supposed to have met up with him sort of thing you know and one of the things he said to us was um divine is how i see you all stay with this we are together on the same path of knowledge when our paths crossed some would mutter divine intervention i shout divine love is stronger and it's a place and its place is one land that you are at peace with. Um, and I just wondered, because talking of our sort of lives, if they're planned out or anything like this, it's sort of like, um, to me, seems like we're linking in with someone that's passed. Um, and he's, he's told us also as well that he's expanded as well and things like that. But I can't understand all what he tells us. I've got it all written.